All right, let's see if we are live. Seems like we are live. So greetings, everyone. This is David Arhan, as usual. Uh, but what's kind of unusual is that one of the few times in my channel I have a guest with me and a, and a very esteemed guest with me, Father John Whiteford. Uh, in this stream, we're going to be talking about what baptism is, what it does as a sacrament. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about how the church receives people outside the church, some of the historical disputes about it and how we can correctly understand those disputes and how the church understands receiving converts from um, non-Orthodox backgrounds into the Orthodox church. So uh, for those who don't know, I, I usually let my guests introduce themselves. Uh, so as per to that tradition that is unique to me, um, Father John Whiteford, uh, I will be very happy to have you introduce yourself, you know, tell my audience who you are. I think most of my audience already have a good idea, but for those who don't. Well, I, I, I was um, born in California, raised Nazarene until I was in college. I moved to Texas when I was 10. My father's from Texas, so I claim inheritance rights uh, in that respect. And uh, when I was in college, I was studying to be a minister, but started reading the Fathers of the Church and converted. So I was baptized in 1990, um, and my wife was baptized the following year, And uh, because partly because I didn't tell her anything about orthodoxy until I was sure that that's what I wanted to do. So she had some catching up to do. But um, I've been uh, a clergyman since 1995 and a priest since 2001. And um, I have a parish in Spring, Texas, which if Houston had a toupee, Spring, Texas would be the toupee. And um, we have um, been growing and uh, we're, we're working on building a new building. So, uh, And I have a blog and I have uh, uh, our parish website publishes a lot of liturgical texts that people might have made some use of. Yeah, um, I I've definitely personally have made use of a lot of the stuff, especially when I was new. But even today, I remember during the 2020, you know, nonsense uh, stuff that was going on. The typica that was in your website was quite helpful um, for me to kind of like use as a resource. And I, I think for a lot of people as well. So as I said, in this stream, this stream is going to be about baptism. Uh, before we kind of get into the really juicy stuff that a lot of people like to debate about, I want to kind of take things to the basic level first and just uh, perhaps I think you as a priest who will uh, have a much better expansive power over these things than I do in, in terms of the basics because my, my brain usually works in like advanced stuff and the basics I falter. Um, what is baptism? What even is baptism? What does it do? And just kind of the theology behind baptism. Uh, well, baptism according to St. Paul, he connects it with circumcision, basically says that baptism is the circumcision not made by hand. So it's the sign of the new covenant. And um, so when you enter into the new covenant, you're baptized. And unlike the old covenant, the males and females are received into the church the exact same way. And um, so when you're baptized, you're united to Christ and you're united to the church. St. Paul says that we are buried with Christ and baptism, so we're buried into his death and we're raised to new life when we're lifted up out of the baptismal font. And so that's how we gain uh, entry into the church and how we begin to um, open ourselves up to all the, the sacraments and all the other spiritual blessings that there are in the church. Obviously, if you don't make use of those things, the baptism of itself is not going to make you a holy person. Uh, it's kind of like having health insurance. When you have health insurance, that means you get to go see a doctor. But if you don't go to the doctor, that health insurance doesn't do you any good. So you 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 have to actually make use of it. But it it makes it 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 provides you with the potential for becoming a saint, and it washes away our sins. We're told. And uh, so that's the beginning of the Christian life, not the ending, but the beginning. Yes. And uh, in terms of that kind of like the, the one thing that I will add, I think it's first of all, it's very interesting that you point out to that um, when it comes to baptism, there's a connection with circumcision. In fact, 
when, when we come to like the argument about reception, I think one of the things that I will point out is that this typological connection is used by some saints like Saint Optatus in explaining in, uh, reception. Another thing is uh, in Saint Gregory the Theologian's 40th oration on baptism, uh, one of the very interesting things that he points out that I think is also very important in this discussion is that he says, and since we are double made, I mean of body and soul, and the one part is visible and the other is invisible, so the cleansing also is twofold by water and the spirit. So the, the one received visibly in the body, right? So that's the washing. And the other concurring with it invisibly and apart from the body. The one typical, the other real and cleansing the depths. Um, and just like with baptism, all sacraments have a very Christological element to them. It's an entrance into the life of Christ. That's why we baptize infants and we commune infants because Christ himself was an infant, right? And so it is a repetition of that uh, life of Christ and that we are entering into that life of Christ and that life of Christ is available again for infants as well as any person on in any uh, part of their life so to speak so there there is that aspect as well and with Christ's baptism which the feast day is uh, both in the old and in the new calendar is coming quite soon uh, is really the blessing of the baptismal waters uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit right so Baptism, like all divine activities, are done from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. We, we take on Christ, right? We, and we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is, we are given the grace of God in the Holy Spirit. So those are kind of the, some of the things that I will kind of add, uh, the nerdy elements, so to speak. Mm, so having, having said that, I think, I think this is a decent enough kind of introduction to this. Um, if, if you don't have anything else to add, Father, I, we can kind of move on to the next section, which is about reception. Do you have anything else to add? Well, the only thing I would say is when you're talking about infant baptism is that um, they didn't wait till a Israelite child decided for themselves that they wanted to be circumcised. They circumcised them on the eighth day. And uh, in the law of Moses, it actually says that if a child is not circum if a male child is not circumcised on the eighth day that he's cut off from the people because he has broken the covenant and so it's talking about an eight day old infant breaking the covenant but it's actually the parents making that decision for them uh, and everybody would have understood that so when people say well a baby can't make a decision for themselves well parents make decisions for their babies all the time and uh and and, and uh people in the Bible were not nearly as individualistic as uh, as we are in our society. Yeah, that, that's also a very good and also very important point about this this as well. Um, and, and another thing is that a lot of people think that baptism is just like a symbolic thing that doesn't have any real meaning. Well, I think that kind of relegates baptism to just another type of, another kind of circumcision. It's like just like, it's, it's like circumcision, but it's a different kind. And I think it kind of makes it devoid of 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 meaning. And and as again, as Saint Gregory the Theologian points out, the washing is double because we are double body and soul, and and that's why there is regeneration in baptism, which is why um, there is you know one baptism as both Scripture and the Creed says, right? There's one baptism for the remission of sins, and that this baptism regenerates us. Um, so I I think the next what we can get into is the process of receiving converts into the church. Um, what, what I will kind of add uh, to this is there's kind of like this threefold aspect of receiving converts into the church that we must, we must consider. And this is something that is pointed out in Canon 95 of Trullo. We're going to get to that kind of stuff later, but uh, it talks about, you know, the aspect of baptism then chrismation and confession, right? So we have the regeneration, right? And the illumination, from chrismation. This is also something that St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, points out. And then there is, um, you know, the confession of true faith, right? So you must have the true faith, you must be washed, and you must be illumined. That is, your eyes must be opened, um, in a sense, to, to truth. Uh, it, I guess you can kind of say it like that. So there is that structure going on in receiving. So I don't come from a Christian background. So I was baptized with in, in living water, try and immersion, and I had to confess the faith, and I also was chrismated. Um, so that's that's a kind of like a, like a threefold step that is important to point out. Um, 
And what usually, the reason why I'm pointing this out to a lot of people that might not understand the point of this is this will become very important when it comes to receiving converts from different backgrounds. Um, and this kind of gets into the history of the church. And so, Father, uh, would you like to get into kind of like the history in terms of, you know, receiving converts from different backgrounds, what, what different councils have said on it? And then we can kind of move on to other things as well. Well, there were different practices in the in the early church prior to Nicaea, and one of the more famous disputes on this question was between Saint um, Cyprian of Carthage and uh, uh, Saint Stephen of Rome. Two, so two saints disagreed. Saint Stephen took the position that if someone was baptized, and I think presumably properly, in the name of the Trinity, that they should not be uh, baptized when they are coming into the church. So if they came from some schismatic or heretical group, that they had been baptized correctly, the church would just simply receive them, uh, either by chrismation or maybe even by profession of faith, as you said, and renunciation of heirs. St. Cyprian took the hard line that if someone was baptized outside the church, that uh, they should they their baptism was not a real baptism. And so, therefore, they should be received by baptism. And um, what's interesting is, is as you mentioned, uh, the the ecumenical councils embraced local councils that come out kind of, in some ways, you could say on both sides of this. But you have to assume that the ecumenical councils weren't just trying to confuse people, but that they saw some way that the, these various councils could agree where they were at least not contradictory but they, they added complementary truths saint cyprian's council of carthage issued only one canon and that one canon was on this issue and it said that there's no baptism outside of the church so i think that at a minimum we have to interpret that canon to mean that there are no real sacramental grace-filled baptisms that happen outside of the church. That's a minimal interpretation, because if they didn't want to say that, there was absolutely no reason for them to mention this council at all. As a matter of fact, they should have probably condemned it if they, if they didn't agree with that. But the, the ecumenical councils also embraced canons that uh, said that we can apply economy. And St. Basil's first canon talks about St. Cyprian and the different opinions on this question. And he talks about it in terms of uh, strictness or acrovia and economia. And, uh, and so people who, you often have people who say, well, the whole idea of economy is just something that St. Nicodemus and the Colibadis fathers came up with, you know, in the last couple hundred years. It's right there in St. Basil's first canon. And uh, so I think St. Basil's first canon explains to us how we should understand this issue as well as anything else you're going to find. And um, so the church has the right to apply economia when it sees, you know, when it's receiving some group of people, and even Arians who denied the Trinity, denied that Christ was, uh, was truly God, Nevertheless, they baptized people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they did it in the exact same way that the rest of the church did. And uh, so, and also during the Arian controversy, there was a lot of back and forth. You know, you had bishops that were kind of fuzzy on, on some of these issues, and you had some people who went this way, and then they went that way. And a lot of innocent people, you know, they didn't know what was really going on. They didn't understand all of these issues. And so it didn't make sense to the fathers of the first ecumenical council to say, let's make these Arians all, let's treat them like they were heathen and we'll baptize them, uh, chrismate them, and uh, you know we'll go from there. And if they're clergy, we'll have to reordain them if we ordain them at all. This would have obviously put up a big barrier uh, to receive such a large number of people. And uh, and so the church said, well, look, we can apply economia with the, you know, the Holy Spirit will fill up whatever is lacking in the sacraments that they received and they'll be united with the church. And so you have to accept that that's possible. <laughs> so I, I think we have to say there's no real baptisms outside the church on the one hand, but the church 
can make those baptisms real baptisms by reception. Uh, th- th- that's th- I don't see how it, you can make any sense of the ecumenical councils by coming to any conclusion otherwise. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And what I see online uh, is I see two extremes. And I think some people might interpret this as kind of like a you know criticism of Father Peter here's an Orthodox Eto, so I want to be clear that I, that is not the case. But I do see two extremes in this issue. One extreme, which tries to take the Roman Catholic, you know, sacramental view that, uh, which there are pre-schism saints that did hold to that view, right? Uh, that basically argue that outside of church there are sacraments, right? There are valid sacraments, but they're not efficacious, and they're only efficacious inside the church. Um, in a sense, I, I will say there is some things that we can agree on. In another sense, no, right? Um, and then there's the other position, which is, again, the extreme. And I want to represent kind of like the extreme position. It's like there's absolutely no you know, sacraments outside the church, including baptism. Um, you cannot accept baptisms outside the church where you end up basically anathematizing the other half of the church if you take the extreme position. So the point that you made about the Council of Trula and the Council of St. Basil I think it allows us to harmonize the two positions and use them in moderation. And I'm going to give another example um, from a saint. This is Saint Dionysius of Alexandria. He's a third century saint. He was contemporary, contemporary with Pope Saint Stephen and Saint Cyprian. He lived at their time. Now, Saint Dionysius believed that rebaptism was unnecessary, right? So that was his position. So he kind of agreed with Saint Stephen's position. But what's really interesting, in the sense that he didn't. Dis- agree with St. Stephen, is in his letter to Philemon uh, on the question of uh, the Council of Carthage's decision to rebaptize heretics, St. Dionysius says, I cannot bring myself to reverse their decisions and involve them in strife and controversy, for thou shalt not remove, it says, thy neighbor's boundaries which thy father set. So you can see here that St. Dionysius, his personal view is that we really shouldn't rebaptize heretics that were baptized in correct form, right, external form. But he says, well, this church, you know, they have these kind of, you know, canons. They're free to follow them. And St. Basil the Great himself, I think also in Canon 1, where he basically says, well, we also know that there are different canons, and he's referring to the West, and they follow these things differently. They can do that, right? So what the, the way I understand is that the church's view on this is not rigorous, although I don't like the term. And neither is it, you know, Roman Catholic or Augustine, whatever term you want to use. It's the moderate position where uh, it, on one hand, right, when you're receiving someone who has, and it's important to point out that we're talking about someone that ha- that was baptized outside of church in correct form, right? Try and baptism in living water according to what was given by the fathers, which I guess it's a different uh, subject, but in America, it's kind of like a difficult, difficult subject, right? But if that has happened, then what is given is the physical washing, right? What St. Gregory the Theologian says, the physical washing is given. But what is lacking is the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. And Pope St. Leo, in fact, in letter uh, 159, he's against rebaptism, but he points out, well, the baptism outside of church is the dead, bare form of baptism. And what makes it living is the, you know, the confirmation, right? So he argues it's the confirmation of chrismation that makes it living. Um, there's two analogies. So you pointed out with circumcision, right, as uh, baptism is the prototype of circumcision. I think St. Optatus argues, for example, that um, let's say in the in the time of the Old Covenant, someone was circumcised, but they weren't circumcised into the true faith. Well, there's that external reality of circumcision, but that reality of circumcision in which one is united to God, right? It's separated from other people and is worshiping the one true God. Unless that person enters into a covenantal relationship with God, that circumcision doesn't have meaning. But when one enters into a covenantal relationship, now it has meaning. It's the same thing, uh, I think you pointed out on, on Twitter as well, The and, and your article, the soldier's mark in St. Augustine's analogy. If, if a LARPer wears the soldier's mark, but it's not an actual soldier, then that mark doesn't have any meaning in a sense. But when he becomes a soldier, now that mark has meaning. So when someone is baptized outside of church and is received into the church by chrismation and confession, then that dead bear, 
you know, that bare form of baptism that does not have the power of sanctification. Now it has the power of sanctification by that person being inside the church. So one thing I want to say very clearly to a lot of people watching this is that if you have been baptized outside the church and you've been received into the church by chrismation, you are just as much as inside the church as I am, as Father John is, as any other Orthodox Christian is. Um, that's how the church has, that's how the bishop has administered the canons and how he's supposed to apply them. And that's what, that's what, you know, that's the decision that's made. And it's sensible. On the other hand, um, the baptisms out there, outside of church, as uh, Father uh, Florowski says in his, on the house of the father, well, the point of baptism is to unite one to the church, right? And when one is baptized, baptized outside of church, he's not united to the church, right? So there's that fullness lacking. And that's why we also, you know, some bishops can decide to rebaptize as well. It's not really a proper rebaptism. Uh, so but we're going to add, we're going to add some. I'm sorry for speaking a lot on this, but uh, if you have yeah. anything else to add, uh, go ahead. Uh, somebody was just trying to call me on, on my phone. Sorry okay. about that. Um, but uh, I think that St. Augustine's analogy on the military mark is one of the most important points that a lot of people are unaware of because St. Augustine is usually just assumed to agree with the Western position, which is also assumed to mean by many people that there are real baptisms outside of the church. And while he certainly did accept the Western view that people who were baptized with the correct form should not be baptized when they come into the church, that analogy makes it very clear that he sees this as an empty form. And it's only it, ha it has to be given significance by entry into the into the church. And if it doesn't have that, then it's not it, it, it's not what baptism is, is supposed to accomplish. You you're not united to the church. Yeah, that's true. And in, in the sense of like rebaptism, what is be really repeated is the rewashing, right? So St. Paisios, right. uh, for example, says that, you know, the baptism of the heretics is just the washing. Um, I think, well, that's something that's referred to as in Arian baptism as well. I think St. Athanasian is discourse against Arians, in fact, says that very clearly against them. Um, yeah. But again, what was given, the bodily washing, right, which represents and, and it represents the kind of spiritual washing is actualized and activated inside a church. And so what is being repeated is just the physical washing, not the it's baptism, which an essential component of this is receiving the Holy Spirit and uh, being regenerated. So this is why, you know, both forms of reception um, is acceptable to the church. And it's up to how the church administers this form of reception, um, whether one is baptized or whether one is um, chrismated into the church. They're both members of the church fully. And um, the problem that a lot of people had with the rebaptism uh, view is that, well, repeating a baptism is re-crucifying Christ, right? That's kind of what St. Paul says. So they don't want to go to that conclusion. That's a very problematic conclusion. So if someone, let's say hypothetically, someone apostatized, he was baptized into the church, he apostatized, then he enters into the church. Well, that person should not be baptized again, obviously, right? right? That's that will be sinful rebaptism. That's unacceptable. Um, but by you know not recognizing the baptism outside the church, which there are many saints that do that. Saint Kirill of Jerusalem in his catechetical lectures says that very clearly. Saint Basil the Great says that the apostolic canons, the eighty-five apostolic canons, ratified by the Council of Trullo, many of the cat like many canons, Canon forty-six, forty-seven, forty-nine, fifty, um, even sixty-eight. I mean, pretty much say heretics don't have baptism. So um, there is that position. But then there is also the economia position, like the Council of Carthage in 4, uh, 419, right? That does say that there is some sacramental aspect of baptism outside the church. And the Council of Trullo Canon 9 to 5. And this is why, as you pointed out, St. Basil and St. Nicodemus's Acrivia Economia distinction actually harmonizes the two positions. Um, and points out that, well, even with economia, there needs to be presuppositions filled. And I will say the presupposition is just the physical form being correct. And at that stage, it's, it's up to the administration of the church, how it administrates and decides to um, use these canons for the good of the people that are entering into the church. So that's kind of my, uh, my general assessment to kind of the issue. Um, do you have anything to add? 
Well, I think that uh, one one of the big issues that 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 relates to what we're talking about is is that at this point in church history, most of the non-orthodox that we come into contact with do not baptize with a proper form. At the most, you might have Roman Catholics or Lutherans that do something that could be done in an emergency in baptism, you know, by baptism by pouring. Uh, but uh, most evangelicals are baptized by a single immersion, and we have the uh, First Ecumenical Council saying that Eunomians had to be received by baptism because they only baptized by a single immersion. And another thing that's interesting is that in English, there's a w one of the oldest service books we have translated into English is the Hapgood service book. And this is obviously based on Slavonic originals, so I'm assuming that the, the Slavonic text for these services would be the same. But when you look at the service for receiving converts by chrismation or by profession of faith, it talks about different groups. It talks about Roman Catholics. It talks about uh, Monophysites. It talks about Reformed, and it talks about Lutherans. It doesn't talk about Baptists. And you have to ask yourself, why are Baptists not mentioned? Well, it's not because there were no Baptists in Russia, because as a matter of fact, there were more Baptists in Russia than there were uh, Lutherans or, uh, or, or Reformed. You know, there were a lot of Baptists in Russia, in certain parts of Russia. And so I think that that omission was not accidental. I think that they just assumed, well, these people have to be baptized. I, I think that was the, the, the pre-revolutionary Russian practice. But on the other hand, uh, we have saints like um, uh, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who uh, was baptized as a Lutheran, received by chrismation. And I don't know how many Rocor parishes have her relics in the antimons that they celebrate the liturgy on, but I know that quite a few of them do. <laughs> and our parish, uh, for most of its history, had an antimons with her relics in it that we celebrated every liturgy on. Now we have a new antimons that doesn't, we don't know whose relics are in there, but we have an extra antimons that still has her relics on her feast day. We still celebrate the liturgy on her feast, and we this is one that we use when we have to serve the liturgy elsewhere. Uh, but uh, so if if chrismation doesn't work, <laughs> and if uh, if the Grand Duchess Elizabeth really wasn't Orthodox, there's a lot of Rocor parishes that are celebrating the liturgy over the relics of somebody who was uh, a Lutheran. Yeah, uh, that will be the logical conclusion of one of the extremes, right? So I think that's that right. kind of illustrates that again. Before we kind of try to anatomize the other half of the church let's try to harmonize the two positions if it's possible and i think again in trulo it is possible um and uh there's there's also a lot of interesting things like father sir from rose the way he was received he was received by chrismation as well right. um saint john maximovich chrismated converts uh but on the other hand there is a father cosmos who's the missionary uh to uganda right in zaire and in his book it points out that he, he baptized everyone right and so our point is, you know, this is just, it's, it's not really a contradiction. It's a difference in practice, right? It's not a contradiction in ecclesiology. It's a difference in how uh, these bishops, these priests, these holy men are practicing um, what was handed down to them. So uh, with, with uh, the Council of Trullo, Canon 95, you know, talking about how, for example, Nestorians and Monophysites are received by confession right which is you know the right faith actualizing the you know the the sacraments of chrismation and the baptism when they enter into the church again there's a very interesting thing that's going on is that even if we are receiving these people by chrismation or even confession it's still by a sacrament which showcases that the sacraments of the other church is not accepted i mean it would be kind of ridiculous to say that the monophysites have baptism they have chrismation but they don't have confession right that sounds kind of strange um well that's not the logic that is being followed it's a very different kind of logic that is being followed in this case and i also want to note that people are so, some people are asking questions uh are you fine with answering questions at the end of the stream father sure. sure yeah so we will answer the questions at the end of the stream um now i kind of want to get to having explained these things i want to kind of get to um some councils and fathers and and canons on baptism what they say 
Um, so some people might kind of be, maybe they might be scandalized by me saying, you know, chrismation is acceptable, etc. Well, St. Mark of Ephesus, who is very clearly not an ecumenist in his encyclical letter, um, when he talks about Roman Catholics, he says, we anoint the Roman Catholics when they come to the church. That is, we chrismate them, right? And, and he says, if it is necessary to catechize, then it's clear that they must be chrismated. Latins must not be rebaptized, but only after the renunciation of their heresies and confession of sins. St. Mark is not an ecumenist, right? He's basically saying the practice of the church in Constantinople is to receive them by chrismation. Now, 200 years before, and the Council of Trent criticizes the Orthodox for this, is the Orthodox used to actually baptize Roman Catholics, right? Um, so... You know, that was, again, an administrative decision that was made. And then at the time, St. Mark of Ephesus, a different administrative decision was made. Council of Constantinople 1484, which rejected the Council of Florence, says we accept Roman Catholics by chrismation. Council of Moscow in 1667 does the same. Um, Council of Jerusalem 1672, you know, points out the same. But at the same time, we must also not forget that these are just different applications of canons. Again, the apostolic canon still stand, which says you must rebaptize. And so on this basis, you have, for example, Council of Constantinople 756 that say we baptize Roman Catholics. So what is going on is that there's the, the, these councils are not trying to push different ecclesiologies. These right. councils are just pointing out we have made a decision on how to administer, you know, reception in this and this other manner. Right. So this is why I have St. Nicodemus, the Hagia, right? Saying that Latin baptism is not a baptism, we you know, and and we don't you know, we baptize or or wash the Latins that come to the church. Um, I think uh, what else was it? Yeah, Father Florowski says in the House of the Father says the entire meaning and strength of the sacrament of holy baptism is that the baptized enters into the one church. So even an Augustinian will admit that if you're baptized into a different church than the true church, then you're not into the one church, right? So it's very clear that Father Florowski, even though he talks about the limits and boundaries of the church and talks about how there's some churchnessness outside the church, he still points out, well, there's still the one true church, right? This is pointed out by Father Demetrius Daniloy. Um, so there's these decisions that were made. And to kind of get back really early, uh, we can even cite Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian. Now, these are not saints, but they are witnesses of church history. And Clement of Alexandria in the Stromata says uh, that heretical baptism is not proper and true water. Tertullian uh, also says that, uh, he says, because they, ha they and we have not the same God, nor one that is the same Christ, therefore their baptism is not one with ours either. So this is, I think, pretty clear, right? So in the early church, there was this idea. That's what the apostolic canon referred to. So what I'm trying to say, again, I'm not trying to say there are contradictory ecclesiologies at play. What I am saying is that the acrivia economia distinction is the only logical way that you can explain the witness of the church in this manner. And um, once we understand that as the reality, it, I think, helps a lot of people to understand that whether you were chrismated or confessed into the church, you're still a full member of the church. Whether you were baptized again, you're bishop or you you didn't commit a sin, right, by being re-baptized because it's really not a re-baptism. And, um, and I think that's kind of pretty much what I had with some of the sayings of the fathers. If, you, if I missed anything, Father, I, would you like to add some other stuff? I'm sorry again for you know monologuing a lot but i just prepared a lot of notes so i had to kind of go over them well one other uh, issue on the contemporary l level is you know rogue war gets criticized by some of the people on one end of this discussion because back in i think it was around 1971 or something our bishops decided that the rule would be to baptize everybody but that with the bishop's blessing People could be received by economia and so you 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 have people saying well that's contradicting the canons of the church but the the thing is the canons are all they, they come from a particular point in history and you can't assume that just because uh you know for example you know some some uh, one of the pan-orthodox councils that said roman catholics should be received by 
uh, profession of faith or by uh, chrismation, however it, it was decreed, that that's forever true if Roman Catholicism starts to fundamentally change. And, uh, and Roman Catholicism is not what it used to be. Um, you know, when you have clown masses, you have priests uh, riding it, into, into church on a hoverboard, uh, wearing clown suits, uh, doing blasphemous stuff in church, uh, it's not quite the same as it used to be. And, and, uh, and, but at least with Roman Catholics, you still can reliably predict that if somebody was baptized as a Roman Catholic, that they were baptized in the name of the Trinity. But you have a lot of groups these days that I, you can't make that even that assumption, like Episcopalians. Uh, unless you have a videotape of how someone was baptized, there's no way that you can really be sure that they were not baptized in the name of the Creator, or Redeemer, and the Sustainer, or the Father, or the Mother, and the Child, or you know who knows who. Uh, so that's the reason why Roquor took this position was because we are in a time of of apostasy, even by heretical standards, where the the heresies have, have apostatized from what they used to believe, and uh, and and so that's why these things have been tightened up, and 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 I think it's not a, a bad practice at all. And a matter of fact, I was received by baptism when I came into the church. I've never regretted it. I've never met a single person who's regretted being received by baptism. I have met a lot of people who regretted being received by chrismation, and I always assure them if there was a sin involved in how they were received, it's on the bishop, it's not on them. And uh, that we have to believe, if we believe that bishops have the power to bind and to lose, we have to believe that they can bind and lose. <laughs> and just because they do something that we don't necessarily think they should have done doesn't mean that uh, it's not bound in heaven when they when they do it here on earth. And so uh, I, I don't want anyone to think that because they were baptized, I mean, received by chrismation as a you know, member of another uh, local Orthodox church, that they have any reason to doubt their faith. But I do think as, where we are in history today, there's a lot of good reasons why we should be very sparing in how we apply economia, unless we're dealing with people who really have not changed much uh, in the intervening time. Like, you know, the cops, I would say, are pretty much the same as they've been. And there's not any reason to receive them in a way different than what the canons say to receive them as. But uh, the Roman Catholics are not the same bunch of people. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point to make. Um, in America, there's a it, it's a wild land nowadays. Uh, anyone can do anything, so there's not much certainty. So it it does make a lot of sense to just baptize as a general rule, because as as you point out, there's a you don't even know how the baptism is done properly nowadays. Um, and uh, I was going to add something else, but I kind of. I kind of forgot, <laughs> so that's that's not good news. But another thing that I also wanted to point out with uh, the distinction of Akrivia and economy as well, um, it's again, it's very important to point out that when we talk about these things, it's about how these canons are used. And you gave a very good example of why that's the case, right? So the Roman Catholics of Saint Mark of Ephesus's time—that's what I was trying to say. I remember just now. The right. same, you know, the Roman Catholics at that time are very different than the Roman Catholics that we have today. The very, very different. We also have to understand that the Orthodox Church was very, very hopeful for a re reunion with the Roman Catholics for a very long time as well, right? Even after rejecting Florence, we were still hopeful that we would get some things done, and and you know get the schism over it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And uh, I, a good example is in the Council of Florence, St. Mark, just because he didn't want to open up new wounds, he didn't. He blatantly refused to get into discussions about essence energy distinction um, because he knew that if he entered that discussion, there will be even more, more, more issues to fight over. That's the last thing you want to have when you're trying to unify. So you can't do that. Um, <clears throat> but again... That, that trend has changed over time. And one of the reasons I, I also think it's important to point out that sacraments are only in the church in its fullness, right? Not in their physical form, but its fullness um, is not outside the church, is that 
we don't believe in this idea of partial communion, right? Even those, you know, even Orthodox Christians who subscribe to some kind of Augustinian ecclesiology um, or some thought, some people that are claimed to be subscribing to that, they don't subscribe to that idea. But the idea of partial communion is a logical outworking of recognizing in its fullness the sacraments of heretics. That's why the Roman Catholic Church has it today. That's why you have their apologists saying that we are in partial communion with the Roman Catholics. I mean, that's just ridiculous and completely laughable. You're either inside the church or you're not inside the church, right? You can argue about some kind of churchnessness or some kind of Christianity-ness outside the church, right? There are fathers that do that, um, but they don't say that they are partially in communion with the church. You're either fully in the church or you're not. And it's a very important point to make as well. Right. Now, what a lot of the apologists on the other end of this will say, it, it, they, they accuse people like us of saying that outside of the church, there's undifferentiated darkness. And that's obviously not what we're saying, because, you know, to the extent that the Roman Catholic Church has preserved things in common with us, that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, we, we don't dismiss that. And we certainly don't say uh, that you know, we're not pronouncing how God's going to judge them on the last day or anything like that. That's between them and God. Uh, but they're obviously outside of the church. Now, they, they may have elements that are in common with us. They may be close to us in many ways. And, uh, you know, I, having been raised as a Protestant and known a lot of very pious Protestants, I knew a lot of people who I thought were very loving uh, Christians in, in, in to the extent that they understood what that meant. And, and, and in many ways, they put most Orthodox Christians to shame. Uh, and so I, on the day of judgment, I don't think that God is going to look at somebody like that who didn't know anything about orthodoxy and say, well, look, you know, I'm sorry you didn't know about orthodoxy, but too, too bad, so sad, you know, go to hell, do not pass, go. Uh, that's not what I think would happen, but we don't have a dogmatic teaching of how some, God would judge such things because it's really outside of our competence. It's outside of the church, and that's between them and God. Uh, but, but. So, so we're not saying there's no differences, but we, but there is a sharp distinction between either being in or not, and 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 that's undeniable. You you can't be halfway in. Yes, indeed. So, uh, I think that I think a lot of I'm kind of surprised because it it went by quicker. Usually, my videos and my streams tend to be like at least an hour long or two hours. Usually, two hours. I think forty minutes. I, is is more i think we kind of got over a lot of different things as well one thing i would recommend to the people watching this is that i will recommend you check out if you're interested in what the fathers say some of the fathers say ubi petrus's floor legium on baptism um he, he doesn't have it an exhaustive list i i had to search for some of the stuff myself but um it shows a lot of what the fathers say about how we're supposed to receive you know certain heretics certain converts and I guess we can, we can kind of fin, uh, finish this section with a summarization of the Council of Trula. What the Council of Trula says is that what's important to point out is in, in, in the second canon of the Council of Trulo, it accepts various canons of different local councils that, like the apostolic canons, that say you should, you should rebaptize those coming into the church, that the heretics and you know schismatics don't have baptism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then it accepts the canons of St. Cyprian and St. Basil the Great, where St. Cyprian on the one hand kind of, you know, repeats that. And then St. Basil kind of says, well, that is indeed true. But recognizing the physical form, we can indeed, in a sense, um, accept them by economy. And economy doesn't mean that God magically baptizes them. It means that their physical form is actualized when they recede by chrismation, because what was lacking is being provided. And so both forms of reception is acceptable, provided that they are done in correct presuppositions. Um, and, 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 and this can be supported by, you know, the Queen of Sex Council also recognizing, the Council of Trilo, that is, also recognizing Council of Carthage, which does recognize validity of heretical schismatic, you know, baptisms, right? I think specifically Canon 57. I might be, yeah, Canon 57. So... I think that's a good summary and a kind of like a good explanation of some of the common questions a lot of people have. Um, and would you, I think I asked this before, but would you be fine with answering some questions that people in sure. the audience have? Okay. Sure. So 
yeah so people in the audience people in the stream if you have any questions that you want to ask in the stream i'm going to go over some of the questions that was asked um but if you want to ask some questions this is probably the best time to do so make sure to like the stream as well subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and um those who are joining you know halfway through i will recommend you uh to watch this from beginning to the end because i think unless you do that there's going to be a lot of misunderstandings right so like depending on when someone joins they might be thinking that we are rejecting um you know the idea of chrismation and then like and another time they might be thinking that we're rejecting uh, <laughs> um you know rewashing or some sort so uh, we're not doing anything of that sort. so i will i will uh recommend it and some people someone said i believe we will disagree with sacramental rigorism uh as someone who kind of is in communication with him on that i think uh, i think uh there are good conversations that i have with him indirectly um and i will kind of is a spoiler a little bit of spoiler but he might be working on something in the future i don't know um so let's see if there are um questions so jason asks aside from emergencies why will it be better to receive a convert by chrismation rather than baptism so this is assuming that that convert had a correct bat you know a tr baptism that was done in the correct form outside of church that is being received into the church well one reason would be just simply because it makes it easier for that person to embrace the faith and i can tell you one example that, that i had and that's that i had a a woman who was a continuing anglican and uh, she had several children her husband was still a continuing anglican but she wanted to become orthodox and he didn't and he was okay with them being received by chrismation but he was not okay with them being received by baptism and so even though she would have been happy to have been received by baptism she didn't want to get divorced over it <laughs> and uh and so I asked for the bishop's blessing, explain the circumstances, and my bishop having the power to bind and to lose said, go ahead and receive her by chrismation. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, so I, the, another example, I had a guy who was an elderly Lutheran man who was married to an Orthodox Christian woman for many, many years. And one day he, out of the blue, said he was ready to become Orthodox, and we've been hoping that that day would come but he was not in very good physical shape. And, uh, and so again, I asked the Bishop's blessing, can we receive him by chrismation? He said, sure. So that's how we did it. Cause he would not have been able to do a full baptism. Uh, granted, we could have baptized him by pouring, uh, but, uh, but the Bishop agreed to go ahead and just receive him by chrismation. And that's what we did. He was also baptized before uh, the Lutheran church went off the rails as it has in, in uh, more recent years. So, uh, so undoubtedly was baptized at least the way Lutherans traditionally had, had done baptism. Yeah. I, I will also add like in terms of like mass conversions, especially when it comes from Uniates, for example, right in Russia, historically um, it's, it's, administratively much easier to accept you know a lot of people by chrismation alone obviously it doesn't mean that you should do that in all circumstances but there's other useful reasons to do so as as well um uh ryan asks um do the eastern orthodox have a concept of conditional baptism could conditional baptism for converts be a solution to this controversy what, what would you say to that you know i've not read a lot about this but i i witnessed a priest who did a conditional baptism i just don't know if the russian church actually has has had an official teaching that this is correct but in this case it was a baby who was in danger of death at her birth and so the father took his own tears and baptized the baby by saying, I, you know, I baptized, you know, or, you know, the, the handmaid of God, so-and-so is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the priest thought that that was a little iffy. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he baptized her and he said, the handmaid of God, so-and-so is baptized if she has not already been baptized. <laughs> and so I'm assuming that, uh, this priest, uh, you know, was told that that was an acceptable way to do it, but I can't say that I've read anything that said this is 
a normal thing to do or not. Yeah, one thing I will say with conditional baptism, I think there is a canon in the Council of Carthage that does talk about... Um, I think it's Canon 57 again that talks about, you know, those who were, you know, those who we don't know were baptized. Um, I think, let me see. I think it's, it's Canon 57, but it, it talks about this, this topic where it's like, well, if you don't know they were baptized, then you should baptize again or something like that. So yeah. like, that's when it's allowed. And I'm talking about Council Cartage 419, right? Um, and, but I think with the idea of conditional baptism, I think it, well, I don't even think it solves a controversy because I don't even think there is an actual controversy. But I will I will say that if conditional baptism can be allowed, then it showcases that the form alone does not give the fullness of baptism. Um, right. right. So it, it showcases that there must be some other things as well that must be considered for conditional baptism to be logically possible in the first place. So I kind of, I personally think in Roman Catholicism, I do think there's good intentions, obviously, with that idea. But I do think with their sacramentology, it might be a bit difficult to argue if um, conditional baptism is something logically arguable. Um, I'm fine if one can point out an argument why that's not the case. But um, the way I understand it is that sacraments in that system tends to be very much a bit divorced from how the priest does it because of the principle of by the operation itself, um, which is something that we don't really accept completely in the Roman Catholic sense. Um, another question is by Peter. He asks, Father Bless, on Twitter you talked about some saints having zero ecumenical canons versus St. Basil having 92. Why is it hard for some to accept certain saints have more authority on these issues? Because they don't like what, uh, you know, the canons actually say. It would be my my first uh, guess at, at why that would be the case. I mean, it's undeniable, in my opinion, that if St. Basil has 92 canons that were embraced by the church, and, I'm, and I remember reading that at the Fourth Ecumenical Council that... Uh, affirming St. Basil's canons was one of the tests of orthodoxy that they used for which bishops were allowed to participate. Uh, so St. Basil's canons have been revered for a very long period of time, and St. Augustine doesn't have any canons that are ecumenical, and it just seems like if they had the same authority, there's St. Augustine certainly provides us with a lot of material from which we could have drawn canons. Because it's not like St. Basil sat down and wrote 92 canons. These are all excerpted from his writings. Uh, but uh, so you could, St. Augustine's probably the most pro prolific writer in the history of the church. So there, there's plenty of material that it could have been drawn from, but it wasn't. And I, I contrary to what a lot of people say about him, I, I love St. Augustine in many respects. I, I find his commentaries to be very useful. And a lot of times the way he looks at an issue, I find to be very insightful. But he's certainly not on the same level as St. Basil the Great. Yeah. Uh, some people will argue against you for saying that by pointing out to the Fifth Ecumenical Council saying um, that St. Augustine is numbered as one of the church fathers, as, as equal in authority as uh, St. Basil, they will point out, without qualification. But if you look at the proceedings of the Fifth Ecumenical Council, um, St. Augustine is given, you know, he's respected with authority. It's because it's in him that you can find the idea of anatomizing those after their death. So that's one of the biggest reasons why he was numbered amongst them. So it's not without qualification. If you read the council proceedings um, on why that's the case, uh, it's actually, I think it clearly shows that St. Augustine, yes, he's indeed a church father. The fifth council accepts it. He's obviously a saint. But what is authoritative about it is, is is different, right? For example, St. Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, he's authoritative as well in his dogmatic writings, but so do we Do we follow him on, you know, some people argue that he was a universalist, some people don't, but the common consensus is he's a universalist. There's, there can be other examples too, right, of different saints. Um, do we follow that? No, right? So it just points out that these fathers have authority, particularly in their dogmatic writings that the church has received, right? Um so that's why I will, I for example, usually argue that it comes to Trinitarian writings, uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, Saint Basil the Great, Saint Gregory of Theology. I mean, these their writings are, in a sense, actually dogmatic. They're explanations of dogma. These are dogmatic teachings of them, um, and and they are, they have you know recognized authority. 
Another question is, um, do you have any comments on the Fifth Council argument that someone might make against you, Father? Or, well, I, I think that the fact that Saint Augustine was named as a as a father uh, just affirms the fact that he he obviously is someone we shouldn't dismiss. But if if the if the ecumenical councils wanted to draw upon his writings to come up with can canons that were the guides of the church for all ages they had plenty of material to pick from and they didn't do it <laughs> so you have to assume that they knew what they were doing so sebastian asks sebastian lopez asks which saint speaks of chrismation as an actualization of heterodox baptism um, I, I hinted at this, but it's. I think it's. I personally think it's very clear in Pope Saint Leo, um, even though he is against you know rewashing or rebaptism, whatever you want to call it. Um, he says in letter one fifty nine, um, in chapter you know the section about baptism by heretics, he says, "For they who have received baptism from heretics, not having been previously baptized, are to be confirmed by imposition of hands with only the invocation of the Holy Spirit." Because they have received a bare form of baptism without the power of sanctification. So notice they had a bare form of baptism, but it's not salvific. It doesn't have the power of sanctification. And he says that this power of sanctification is given in this case with chrismation. He says, and this regulation, as you know, be required to be kept in all the churches, which isn't kept. So that kind of gives you an idea of papal supremacy. But he says it should be kept in all churches that the fonts once entered may not be defiled by repetition uh, he says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? So again, you can see papal supremacy is not really the case because even at his time, there were churches that didn't follow this um, regulation. He says then, but as we have said, only the sanctification of the Holy Spirit invoked that what no one can receive from heretics may be obtained from Catholic priests. This is also a very important point because it showcases that the spirit, right? The, the power of sanctification of the Holy Spirit is something that is exclusive to the to the Orthodox Catholic Church, right? So I think this letter by Pope St. Leo, I think pretty clearly shows that the principle of an empty form of a sacrament can be actualized and living by another sacrament. Um, St. Augustine's argument about the soldier's mark, St. Optate's argument about circumcision, I think these arguments also... Um, apply in in this case yeah i, I would agree entirely i if if they were already uh baptized in the fullest sense of the term that means they would already be in the church and we wouldn't be talking about receiving them in the first place you know if they're if, if they're already members of the church just let them start taking communion that's all you would have to do yeah so let, let's see there's there's a lot of um there, there's a lot of uh hold up <laughs> a lot of questions so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to skim over them um all of them can't be answered so I, I i'll try to get them answered as quickly as as possible uh Outside of Rokor and Mount Athos, how widespread is this view of Akriva economy among the hierarchs? That's, this is Basil's question. Well, you know, I, I, I suppose it's hard to say because you'd have to poll, uh, but I, I would assume that probably most bishops acknowledge that there's at least some truth to it because it's stated right there in St. Basil's first canon. Uh, I know that there are some that try to dismiss it and say, well, it's just St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. So, I, you know, there, there are some that would disagree, but I don't think that most of the ones that have a decent education know the fathers would make that statement. Uh, Jason asks, don't the ecumenical councils that require the eunomians to be baptized because they practice the single immersion show that economy presupposed the correct form has already been given? Um, as in, I don't, I don't really understand the question, but I think what what he's saying is is that he's 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 suggesting that if if some someone was not baptized by a triple immersion properly, then how could you possibly receive them by economia? And um, and the thing is, I would say that obviously what that canon shows us is that the form does matter, 
And so if people are baptized by a single immersion, I don't think that they should be received by uh, chrismation. But you have fathers that thought that if someone was baptized in the name of the Trinity, even if they were baptized by a single immersion, that they could be received by economia. And, uh, and so I think if a bishop goes ahead and does that, you have to assume that, uh, you know, he, his power to bind and loose is effective, even if it's wrong. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it, like I said, it's not totally without precedent, but the fact that the Russian service books don't include Baptist as a category of uh, heterodox Christians that could be received by renunciation of errors and affirmation of the faith and by chrismation, I don't think is accidental. Uh, there's a bit of a debate. All right, question for Father. What are the limits, if any, to how a bishop can exercise economy and apply canons? Obviously, they can't decide to do the Eucharist with donuts, so where is this boundary? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's hard to say exactly you can go this far and no farther because you start getting into things that are abuses. Um, but, uh, I mean, in, in, there, there are uh, stories of uh, the new martyrs who celebrated the Eucharist when they were in prison, you know, prison camps with stuff that wouldn't normally be allowable uh, to be used for it in, the, in the in the celebration of the Eucharist. And I believe one new martyr, he actually celebrated the liturgy on his own chest because he didn't have an antimens. And he he was, you know, ready to die for the faith. And so in the place of where the relics of a martyr would be, he put his own body. But I would say that if a bishop did that and it wasn't an emergency, if he wasn't in an unusual circumstance like that, that that would be an abuse that every bishop would condemn. But but so it's it's just you, you can't say here is exactly where you draw the line. If you go beyond that, uh, it's it's not acceptable. But obviously there would be things that would be clearly beyond that. And, you know, if someone. uh if, well, for example, you know, there, there's a, uh, a priest who had a, a, a mashka who passed away, but he was in the OCA and he got into quite a bit of trouble because he did a corrective baptism in her case, uh, thinking that the bishop approved it. And I suspect probably the bishop did, but then he got heat from the Senate of bishops and they uh, dropped the hammer on this priest. But anyway, his wife was baptized in New England in some congregational church and wasn't even baptized in the name of any deity anywhere. <laughs> she was just, it, she was baptized the way you christen a ship. I baptize you crystal. Like I, I, I christen you the USS uh, Bougainville, you know, it, it, you, that, that's the way you christen a ship. And, uh, and yet, and so this priest did a corrective baptism for his wife. And, and I don't think that he was wrong for doing that. Although, you know, I think, you know, that you can only think the only thing you maybe can fault him on is maybe not getting his bishop's clear blessing to, to do that. But I don't think that his wife was really baptized. But there are examples in the in the lives of the saints and in the writings of the fathers of people who were clearly not baptized correctly. And it wasn't known until later but they'd already been receiving communion and they were told that basically the Holy spirit would fill up what was lacking. And I would say, even in the case of this machka, let's say she got hit by a car before uh, her husband came to the realization that he needed to do a corrective baptism. I don't think that she would uh, be treated by God as being outside the church because uh, the priest that received her didn't bother to inquire more precisely into how she was baptized and just assumed she was baptized uh, in the name of the Trinity. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, there, there are, there are iffy things out, out there. And, and, uh, obviously when you get into these iffy areas, you want to start talking to bishops and other bishops will correct them if they go too far with it. Yeah. Um, I will also say like, um, th this is an argument that's, that's sometimes made for this kind of perspective that we provided, like, um, how is, you know, for example, how is chrismating economia? It's in the canons. 
Um, and, and it kind of presupposes that everything in the canon is a Krivia. Well, I don't think that's a good presupposition. Uh, there are many canons, for example, canons on like baptism in general, that also point out, well, if this is not possible, then you should do baptism XYZ manner. I mean, the XYZ is the economia, but there's still a logic and a regulation behind this principle. Um, and, and I also want people to understand that when we say, you know, chrismation or confession can be done in reception by economia, that's not relegating it to like less importance where you're like, you lack a grace or anything like that. So some people misunderstand it that way, um, but it shouldn't be done so. Uh, Tatiana asks, what about people who want to be baptized, but the bishop refuses? I was able to insist on being baptized, but some are not. Well, I mean, when you say what about, uh, you know, I, I assume you're, the, the question is, is, you know, what should such people do if they're in that situation? And I think a lot would depend on what other options they had. And, you know, if there was a Rokor parish down the street and they uh, wanted to join that parish, then they would obviously be able to uh, be received by baptism. But I don't think that if they went ahead and submitted to what they were being told, that they would be suffering uh, spiritually as a result of that, because the priest that's telling them that is doing what the bishop is telling them to do. And uh, a priest is the deputy of a bishop, and a, bishop, a, a priest can really only do what his bishop gives him the authority to do. And, uh, and, and so uh, I personally, if my bishop told me I had to receive everybody by chrismation that was baptized in the name of the Trinity, I would have to abide by that as long as I remained under his authority. I, I, don't, I don't see how else I could function. Yeah. I think uh, especially when, when with things like this, there's already kind of like a canonical and patristic and traditional precedence. I don't, I, that's why usually with this kind of stuff, I just say, listen to your bishop, even though you don't think it's a good idea or so, because, well, first of all, obedience is a good thing second of all um this kind of obedience you're not it's not a false obedience you're not obeying you know you're not obeying someone to commit falsehood like in the sense of recognizing other churches as real churches or anything like that you're just following the ordinances of the church you know throughout history um so i think there needs to be that kind of distinction to be made basil asks here's a kind of a fun question could a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness be received by economy if they are baptized with the right form? Um, I will say Canon 47 of St. Basil says no. Uh, but what would you say, Father? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I believe Mormons, do baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if you want to take the arguments of the, the people who are on the extreme side to their logical conclusion, you'd have to say that they should be received by economia but i agree with you that if someone doesn't believe in the trinity uh then that you know that they were baptized in a group that should never be given any credibility whatsoever um, but i would also personally say that about most evangelicals because you know if you look at the traditional anglican church from the perspective of our bishops, I could see why they would say, you know what, these people are 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 heretics. They're not orthodox, but they they've retained a lot that that is in common with us. And I could see why they would say the same thing about Roman Catholics or or even Lutherans. But uh, back when they were in their traditional forms, mind you. But when you look at evangelicalism today, there's just not you know the rock bands that and and even though denominations most evangelical denominations would prescribe that you baptize in the name of the father son and the holy spirit you know some some uh, pastor bob that doesn't think baptism actually does anything i could see him saying all kinds of things when he's baptizing people you know i baptize you into the death of christ i, I could see a, a a a perfectly normal evangelical pastor saying that and thinking that he's not doing anything wrong and somebody coming up out of that water and not knowing that that wasn't a, a, a even remotely Christian baptism. Uh, and there are uh, Pentecostal groups that baptize in the name of Jesus only. And I know of cases where they've been received by chrismation because some, you know, priests assumed that they were baptized. They were from a, 
uh, you know, Pentecostal group. And they, you know, at least as far as they were aware, Pentecostals believe in the Trinity. Well, most Pentecostals do, but not all of them do. Some, some of them reject the Trinity. They're, they're basically Unitarians or modalists. And, uh, um, uh, but I could see evangelicals baptizing the name of Jesus sometime. I know I've heard evangelicals say, I sometimes baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I sometimes baptize in the name of Jesus. So I just don't think that we can give a whole lot of weight to people who've been baptized in, in a context like that because they, they don't even have a remote concept of baptism. And also, it, someone made a comment online today that I thought was very uh, insightful. They they were just pointing out that the whole purpose of economia is to basically make it easier for people to come into the church. But if you're a Southern Baptist, being baptized when you come into the church shouldn't bother them at all. Because when I became a member of a Southern Baptist church when I was a kid, I remember that they insisted that everybody who became a member in that church had to be baptized in that church as a profession of faith because they didn't see the baptism in, in the church that I came from in California. And so, uh, and, and if I moved to another Southern Baptist church, there are some so Southern Baptist churches, at least back then that would have said, okay, you need to be baptized in our church. if You're going to become a member because we need to see you profess your faith in Christ. So they don't see it as a sacrament at all. They just see it as a, as a testimony of your faith. So why should it bother them to come into the Orthodox church and be baptized? So if it doesn't bother them, why are we trying to, accommodate concerns that they don't even have <laughs> it doesn't make any sense i very much agree you know i'm not i've only been in america for one and a half years so but i don't know much about like the protestant culture or like yeah. you know christianity there but uh from what i've been hearing a lot that that does seem to be very true um Paisios asks, why do we have to blindly submit to the bishop when it comes to reception when we don't submit to them on teaching heresy, etc.? What saint says reception uniquely requires blind obedience? Well, my my brief answer to this will be, well, first of all, the different forms of reception is not like they're preaching heresy. It's they're regulate they are regulating what was passed down by the fathers and by the council in, in the canons. So it's it's very different from that. Um, obviously, you you shouldn't be, in my opinion. And I think in the opinion of various different states and even canons, you shouldn't be obeying hierarchs that are bareheaded heretics that are clearly preaching heresy. But Nestorius wasn't obeyed, for example. Um, but what St. says the reception uniquely requires, well, uh, it's more than says it's the councils that say you should obey them. And uh, in many different jurisdictions, uh, the the council, the council of Constantinople, the council of Moscow, I mean, the council of Jerusalem, these are authoritative councils that the, the people in the church have followed. Um, now, I, I view them as like normative, authoritative councils, right? So, and I think they are pan-Orthodox in us. They've been accepted by various different patriarchates. So it's very difficult to kind of say, well, it's just like blind obedience. It's it's, a, it's obeying really the history of the church. And and I want to repeat, you know, I'm someone who like, like if I was, you know, I, I don't like saying this because I, I don't want to be one. It's, it's too much responsibility. But if I, by some insane collection of events end up becoming a priest or a bishop which i i, I don't i hope I, i'm not but we'll see um i will basically you know i will take the rocor position which is like you know baptize in general like this is you know i believe that i think that's prudent but i also recognize the history of the church and i and i, I don't think they are intention so that's kind of my perspective on this. What would your perspective be on this, Father? Well, what I would point out is, is that if you uh, were, were trying to be received into the Orthodox Church in uh, the Diocese of uh, Western America, when St. John of Shanghai was the bishop, and you came from a Lutheran or a Roman Catholic background or an Anglican background or a Presbyterian background, you would have been received by Economia. And St. John... If you'd have came up to him and said, I want to be baptized, he told you, I'm sorry, you're not going to be baptized because the Russian church has service books that I pledge to follow. <laughs> and these service books say that I'm supposed to receive by economy. So would you say he was a heretic? Obviously, you, you wouldn't say that. Uh, so I, I think you just have to come to the realization that bishops can have different opinions about such things and not be heretics. Yeah, and and I think as we pointed out, whether you recede by chrismation or 
baptize, you know, re re baptism. At the end of the day, the result is that you your baptism is actualized and you're a member of the church. The result right. is the same. The method is just different. And I right. think too many people focus on the method, thinking that it changes the result. But if you look at the history of the church, this is what the history of the church tells us. I think it's very clear that it tells us that. Um, Orthodox Shahada, a great friend of ours, uh, also a very good channel against you know Islamic theology and stuff. Many good videos. Asks great, you know, says great stream. I agree with everything that's been said here in terms of reception. One caveat, though, I know lots of no sort of RC spirituality is doubtful, but surely among, say, the SSPX and other tra traditional Catholics, anti calcedonians that is monophysites, and other tactile apostolic churches, um, I don't know what ISTM is, but that in the majority, the canonical tradition will recommend chrismation. Thank you both. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would assume that if you had someone who was a cop and they were being received into the church, that you, you know, the, we have canons that tell us how we're supposed to receive them. So I don't see how you would say, well, this person has to be baptized. Uh, but but the, you know, they really have remained pretty much what they've been for you know the last fifteen hundred years, and so I, I I don't think there's a basis for changing our practice. Whereas you know, Roman Catholics and uh, most Roman Catholics anyway, and uh, and certainly most Protestants are not the same as they were even 50 years ago. Yeah. And I will I will also add because, you know, Rouge, who comes from a uh, monophysite background, right? He was in the Armenian church. He was baptized in Jordanville uh, as well, because that's how Jordanville does things. And uh, I'm, I'm ending up repeating myself over in Oregon, but, but it's important because, you know, again, Different method, same result. And uh, right, right. This, these are acceptable methods, depending on how the bishops want to use these methods. Um, and I think I think that pretty much goes over all of the questions that we had. I don't see... Oh, well, there's one more question. Um, I This will be the last question, um, because there's a lot of other questions that have been asked. Uh, I kind of want to end the stream on a good note after an hour. I don't want to keep it too long. Um, so this will be the last question for the stream. Question for Father. I know unbaptized, including babies, don't go to heaven. But what exactly is their fate? My priest told me darkness, but he couldn't give details. Okay, I think this is a good question, actually, that's relevant. So what would you say to this? Well, I, I don't think darkness is a good answer. Um, the... Uh, um, I had an assistant priest who was telling me that he, he read in some writing of a contemporary saint, you know, elder, probably un, unglorified saint, but soon to be, who was talking about how uh, such people would be in a state that would be blessed, but it wouldn't be the same as it would be for those that were actually fully members of the church. And, uh, he also told me another story. I think it was somebody who they, they had a dream that they, they, they were outside the gates of heaven and they, and they, this man walked up to him and said, hi, I'm your brother, uh, you know, Alexios. And, uh, and he, he didn't have a brother named Alexios that he was aware of. And he, and he, and he was talking about, you know, the fact that he was in this state, uh, and, uh, you know, it, that it was, it, it was a blessed state. And, uh, he asked his mother about this and his mother said, Oh yeah, you, you, we had a miscarriage of, of, of a baby that we had decided we would name Alexios, but he was, you know, obviously not baptized. So I, I, we don't have dogmatic, uh, teachings about exactly how these things are worked out by God. We just know that God is loving and merciful and God's not, uh, roasting, babies that die before they're uh they're born or, or die in abortion or die just before they're baptized he's not roasting them in hell because they didn't get baptized you know god's merciful and loving and that they're in a good place yeah uh in terms of the well i, I guess i can provide the father provide the good pastoral aspect of the sense i want to kind of give the scholastic a little bit um not scholastic in the Roman Catholic sense, but kind of like the, the more theological sense. Um, I will. So a lot of people make the mistake of just assuming that Hades 
um, which is distinct from Gehenna, is uh, purely an experience of, you know, you know, un an unsavory experience, so to speak. Right. Uh, there are many saints. Uh, one w that will be relevant here is St. Gregory of Nyssa, who argues that, well, first of all, you know, infants that die unbaptized, well, they're, you know, they didn't receive the baptism, right? So he kind of makes that point. And he also points out, well, it would be very, very unfair if the people who, you know, suffered for their faith and people who attained virtues, um, you know, they went to heaven and then the babies who did nothing also went with them. He kind of says, well, that will be kind of unfair. He then says, well, it will also be unfair if he said, you know, these people were, you know, were burning in hell. So he, he basically makes the point that, it doesn't really go much into detail. He basically makes the point that, look, they are in a state that is better than non-existence, right? They're in a much right. better state than non-existence. They exist. You know, God protects them, you know, and, and all of this reality, right? And they're, they're in a state that is better than non-existence, but they're, they're not, you know, saints, basically. Um, so I think that perspective is a very good account because on the one hand, you're denying the kind of, the extreme of you know baby unbaptized infants go to hell and you know, it's out of the decision but we don't care that's just how god decided to be and you know that's what we've been told um on the other hand it kind of goes over the other extreme perspective it's like oh they're all saints and you know they're, they're all in heaven um i think that's nice but i think it also kind of downplays the um what other people have done but whereas in this case well they do exist they exist in a blessed state in, in somewhat and um they're in a state that's better than non-existence. They don't suffer pain, right? They don't have any sufferings. Even St. Augustine makes that point that uh, unbaptized infants do not suffer in Hades, um, or at the very least they are uh, immune from suffering, right? And this idea of unbaptized infants being immune from suffering is a, is a very typical point that a lot of fathers make. So I think that's very important to point out as well. Now, what will happen in, you know, after the restoration of all things um, I don't know much about what the fathers say, but my personal opinion, I think it's very likely that they will be restored uh, and they will be experiencing the grace and glory of God after the second coming. That's what I personally think. I think that makes a lot of a lot more sense. But um, I, I'm not much. I'm not super well read on this, so I won't really. Um, yeah. No. Uh, I did say this was going to be the last question, but we got two super chats, one from Kara Masao, uh, two Brazilian reals. Thank you for your donation. And Marshall Forward, $5 donation. He asks, because I kind of, you know, if you have a super chat, I have to answer those questions. Um, I can't show, I don't think I can show it on the stream, but he his question is, uh, let, me, let me get the question. His question is, good day, David and Father John. I want to ask, ask the difference. Oh, sorry. He, he. I want to ask. Do you see differences between the Russian and the Greek Orthodox Church? God bless. Well, there's there's a lot of practical differences between the Greeks and the Russians, but obviously the situation in Ukraine has created some other differences. Uh, but uh, you know, it depends on which Greeks you're talking about, and. Um, um, those that are under the ecumenical patriarchate, we have a little bit more differences with right now than we do, uh, say, those that are in the Holy Land under the Patriarch of Jerusalem. We don't have any problems with those folks. Uh, but uh, but we are still not in a full-blown schism. And so when it comes to laity, if you're a Greek and you normally go to a Greek archdiocese parish and you come to a Rokor parish, you're going to be communed, you know, as long as you've been to confession recently. Uh, but, uh, uh, w w so we're not out of communion, but we are not can celebrating with clergy under the ecumenical patriarch right now. Yeah, I think a good way to explain this, and I think it's actually kind of connected with this issue is that, uh, the Greek church, I am, I am in the ecumenical patriarch because I'm in Turkey. So I'm literally under the direct jurisdiction, obviously. Um, uh, but both sides still to this day, to my knowledge, uh, recognize each other's sacraments. So one of the things that happens, uh, especially here in Turkey, is that there's a there's a church that is under the MP. It's an it's an embassy. Uh, it's under the Moscow Patriarchate. So we had a couple of Turkish converts be baptized there, and then they commune in an ecumenical patriarchate church, and that's not seen as a problem. Well, that's because they recognize each other's sacraments, and that's that means they're part of the same church. 
that is also very important to point out that sacraments are only in the church and the recognition of sacraments means that you're recognizing that other church to be part of the orthodox church as well um and i'm talking the fullness of the sacraments. so someone who is baptized in the greek church is recognized as a baptized christian in the russian church and vice versa right. so that's important to also also recognize as well and there's many situations that has happened like this in history i always like to point this out in between 431 and 433, and the, the Patriarch of Antioch and the Patriarch of Alexandria was out of communion with each other, but they recognized each other's sacraments, right? And that issue was much more, and that was much worse because that was over theology. That was over Nestorianism versus Orthodox theology. And right. Antioch defended Nestorius um, until 433 when they realized, okay, we're going to have to accept this, you know, ecumenical council and we're going to have to be in communion again with. Alexandria, right? So uh, there's many instances like this in, in, in church history. So with that said, I, I do not think, okay, I don't think there's any more um, any more questions that I can ask. I think we answered a lot of the questions. Half the stream is just answering questions right now. But um, thank you all for watching. And then thank you, Father, for uh, being my guest in this year. I really enjoyed having you here in the channel i'd like to have you more in my on my channel as well uh for different discussions as well um do you have anything else you want to add before we kind of finish well I, I appreciate it i enjoyed the discussion be happy to be on again and uh, thank you for inviting me all right thank you and thank you all for watching make sure to subscribe if you haven't already like this for the algorithm boosts and show this video to someone who might have questions about reception I think it will be very helpful for them as well. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see all of you in the next video or perhaps in the next stream. Thanks for watching, and goodbye. And that's you.